Hello and good morning to some of you. I hello and good evening to most of you, I think. Um, today is October 29th, um, I guess in, in my part of the world, um, Friday. And for some of you, it's already Saturday, October 30th. Um, and we have with us um, Stanley and Robert, um, who are going to be having a conversation that I am really anticipating to sit in and listen to um, on dreams. So allow me just a few minutes to give you an idea of um, how this all came about. Um, so Robert and Stanley are two of my favorite people that I work with um, in Sophia. And um, I met Stanley back in grad school sitting um, with him for our morning dream tables um, during residence, residency. So it, he really made a, a big imprint on me in terms of what uh, my attitudes are towards dreams and dream analysis. Although of course, like most people in psychology, especially in transpersonal psychology, we have a special, um, I think, interest or a special spot in our heart somewhere for dreams. Um, and I know that's the case for Robert as well. So some of you, um, okay, sorry. Some of you may know um, Stanley and Robert, but not everybody. So Robert is um, Sophia's um, psychology program chair. And Stanley is um, the visiting scholar for MATPO. And this conversation kind of started because some of our MATPO students had questions about dreams um, in an earlier seminar. And the way Stanley had answered, uh, I know I benefited a lot from it. Robert also voiced that he benefited a lot from it. And in a private conversation, we said, wouldn't it be nice to just have Stanley say more about dreams. So here we are, and you're all invited um, to participate. So I want to welcome you to throw in any questions or feedback or comments in the chat. And you're welcome to throw in um, both English and um, in Chinese. Unfortunately, we don't know too many other languages. So <laughs> ask that we keep which is English and Chinese for today um, and we will try to get to most of your questions and if not then maybe we can see if Stanley will join us for another conversation um, down the road okay so I think my time is up I'm going to give um, the mic over to Robert and Stanley thank you Anne and uh I might say that you're one of my favorite people too. So, and I'm, I'm getting to know Stanley and, and the more I know him, the more I like him too. So uh, hopefully he'll tolerate me okay. I do wanna thank you, Dr. Kripner, for your willingness to, to uh, be with us tonight and, and to talk about dreams. And I'll just jump right into it. Uh, <clears throat> Young wrote about there being big dreams and little dreams. And I'm wondering, uh, what would you say that, uh, how would you classify Jung's definition of big dreams? And, and as a corollary to that, if, if those are big dreams, what are little dreams and what are they about? Well, once again, it's hard for me to speak for Jung. He's better off speaking for himself but I would recommend the work of Dr. Bulkley, who also deals with big dreams and little dreams. And I think what both of them might have in common is that the big dreams share certain characteristics. First of all, they're much more emotional, a lot more feeling tone in the big dreams. And why shouldn't there be? If this is something of importance, of course you're gonna feel emotional about it. 
Second, they're much more likely to have archetypal elements. And again, remember that Jung felt that archetypes were passed on from one generation to the next, and they contained basic primordial themes common to all humanity. So if you have archetypal dreams, such as the magical child, such as the great earth parent, such as falling down stairs or losing your teeth. Those are such common dream elements that they really seem to contain archetypal elements. And then I think that the third aspect that you find in the big dreams is that they're so important, so dramatic that you remember them when you wake up. I think that very few people forget big dreams. Of course, we'll never know if that's the case or not, unless we had an all night study with EEGs. But I think that uh, if you keep those three themes in mind, you will be able to determine whether or not your dreams are big dreams or not. And if they are big dreams, all the more reason for you to spend some time doing some analysis to figure out just what those dreams could mean in your life. Where, where do you think, uh, Dr. Kipner, where do you think dreams come from? What's the source of dreams? Well, dreams come from the brain. Dreams start out with electro psychological currents in the old brain, a little gland called the pons, the P-O-N-S. And this moves its way to the amygdala, the hippocampus. And that's where the dreams pick up the memory and pick up the emotion. They move on to the forebrain which then takes all of these images and memories and feelings and very skillfully uh, puts them to a narrative form into what we call a dream. Now, you say where dreams come from, that's where they come from in terms of the brain. Where do they come from in terms of our experience? Well, that's the other side of the question. What we do when we dream, we dream for many, many different reasons. We dream to solve problems. We dream to work through emotions. We dream to store memories. We dream to plan for the future. We dream to develop ourselves in one way or another, spiritual or some other way. All of these are ways that we, oh, and then threat perception. We also dream to rehearse what to do if there's going to be danger or there's a threat. This is one of the oldest and most evolutionarily uh, viable real re reasons that we dream. However, it's more important that we dream anything than that we dream about a particular purpose. All these purposes often overlap. And remember that dreaming is so important for the health of the organism that the fact that we dream and have enough dream time each night to me is really more important than the specific reasons that we dream. I remember in your uh, the discussion we had in one of the seminars with the Chinese students that you mentioned, you said something like uh, dreams want to help us understand something. I can't, can't remember this specific example, but um, but that got me to thinking that 
that dreams aren't entities that have a desire, right? That the dream can't help us to want to understand. It may be a vehicle, but I, I'm trying to understand what part of ourselves would want us to understand a certain message. Did you say what part of the high self? What part of ourselves? What part of ourselves? Maybe the high selves would be a way to say it, but what part of ourselves do you think makes us want to understand something? I think that this depends upon if your question is directed to us while we're sleeping or while we're awake. While we're sleeping, for almost all of the dreams, we do not understand why we're doing a particular dream. It's more important that we craft the dream and put it into a form that makes sense to us. Now, of course, if we're having a lucid dream, during the lucid dream, we can actually ask ourselves, why am I having this dream? And sometimes we will get a pretty decent answer. Now, if you're talking about what happens once we wake up, well, most people do not stop to do any analysis of their dreams. Then why should be dreams are not given much credit in our culture. And if they are given credit, most people don't really have the tools to do an interpretation. If people are in therapy, or if they're a member of a dream group, or if they're analyzing their own dreams, then things are much different. Then they take the tools that they have to work with and put those tools to use in terms of making sense out of the dream and seeing how those dreams can be of some value to us in our lives. I say what tools we have available because some people have more tools than others. Some people have half a dozen different ways of understanding dreams and working with dreams. Other people only have one tool. They've been told if you give the dream a name, that will help you to understand it. That's a pretty good suggestion. Okay, that's their one tool. That won't take them very far, but it's better than nothing. And then as they do more work, maybe by joining the International Association for the Study of Dreams and going to their virtual conventions or getting on their mailing lists, one gradually ex expands the tools that one has to making sense out of a dream. In, in some of my personal experiences with dreams, it, it seems, and uh, I've used mostly Jeremy Taylor's method of, of working with dreams. Just that's been my experience. I've been in a dream group and, and uh, you know, had people kind of project their thoughts onto my dreams and help me have an aha moment. But it seems like some of those dreams come from a source within me that makes, that wants me to do better, that is pushing me to be the most complete human being that I can be. Do, does that make any sense to you? You know, your mouth dropped out of sight. Oh. And, and because my hearing is so poor, I depend upon reading your lips as well as hearing. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'll sit up more straight. <laughs> so my question is, it, it seems to me that there's something in me that drives my dreams to help me learn to be a better human being. Does, does that make any sense to you? Well, I think that this is true of many of our endeavors. I think that there is a drive that most of us have to develop, to improve our understanding of ourselves and the world. And again, this is part of our human evolution. 
we want to stay alive. We want to thrive. We want to enjoy life. We want to be happy. And all of these functions can certainly be assisted by understanding and making sense of our dreams. So I think that this is what you mentioned is very, very common. And sometimes you get glimpses of this when you wake up from a dream. Oh, how can I put that to use to make my life a better life? You get sort of a glimpse of that. And again, I think that that's not all that uncommon. I think this is something that many thoughtful people will run up against and try to put to use. Yeah, in, in my own way of thinking, I, I kind of think of it as, as my soul. <laughs> There's some part of me that makes me want to do the best I can during this life, but that may be just from a lack of, of vocabulary on my part. Uh, and have, have you ever thought of it in those terms? I mean, does, does soul make any sense when speaking of dreams? Of course. Carl Gustav Jung used the term self with a capital S. This was the core element of the human being. I think it might roughly translate into what you're calling the soul. And for Jung, expanding the self, making it more complex, more resilient, and making connections with all the dream elements, this was what he tried to train his clients to do. And this is what he felt was basically our main task in life, to expand and deepen and broaden what he called the self. The self, of course, is one aspect of the psyche, the word psyche, as he uses, is much broader. And the psyche, of course, can contain all sorts of elements that are not yet found in the self, such as the personal unconscious, the collective unconscious, the animus, the anima, the shadow, all of these present raw materials that Jung felt could be incorporated into self with a capital S. Hmm. Well, that's, that's really helpful to me. It, it's interesting to me, I've noticed also that um, The dream dreams take some interpretation. It, it's rarely do I get a message from a dream that is in English, <laughs> a language that you know I understand. It's um, it, it's more um, of symbols that are, or like you say archetypes, and you have to kind of try to figure out what these symbols mean. Why, why do you think it's that way rather than, than just, I, I guess I sometimes in dreams there's English and I have a little bit of Portuguese so that some Portuguese will show up now and then, but mostly it's in these symbols that I have to try to figure out what they mean. Well, you'd mentioned a very helpful method a few minutes ago. And this is something we use in our monthly dream groups in Berkeley. We have a dreamer present the dream. The group members ask questions about the dream, not interpretation questions, just questions about uh, the dream content. And then members of the dream group say, well, if this were my dream, this is what it would mean to me. They are not pushing their interpretation onto the dreamer. They're just telling what it would mean if it were their dream. And sooner or later, they will come up with a suggestion that the dreamer, oh, you know, 
that is true of my dream too. And so the more information, the more ideas, the more projections the dreamer has to work with, the better equipped the dreamer will be to come up with his or her own interpretation of the dream. Now, of course, there are many, many other ways of working with dreams. One method that I used in my dream groups when I was in China was to have people divide into small groups and then act out each other's dreams. Yeah. And this is the psychodrama method. And it can be remarkably effective, especially if you have an audience that watches the enactment and then the audience can get some insights as to the dream also. And so you have the dreamer getting insight, you have the members of the cast acting out the dream, getting insight, and you have the audience watching what's going on and getting insight. So the psychodrama method certainly is a extremely useful method to working with dreams. And again, there are many, many excellent books on dreams. And one of my books has been published in Chinese. And I'm happy to say, I think it sold more books in China than it sold in the United States. And this is my book on extraordinary dreams that deal with unusual dreams, such as lucid dreams. And such as dreams about the future, such as out of the body dreams, all sorts of unusual type dreams. Yeah, it's, I, I happen to have that book. I'll give you a little plug. Oh, for there that. it is. <laughs> there yeah. it is. Wow. Thank yeah. you for the plug. That's <laughs> a, yes. Happy that that's available on Amazon.com. <laughs> exactly. That's where I got it on Amazon. So there yeah. you go. Um, so it, it's interesting to, to me that um, it, that we receive dreams in these symbols and they seem that, that a symbol can have many more meanings than words would have if we were to receive just a message in words and there can be like layers of meaning uh, and I'm often surprised that I was clever enough to dream some of the things I dreamed. It, it, well, you're right. The, uh, the human psyche can be very, very creative. And this is necessary when you're working with dreams because both Jung and Freud felt that an individual dream can have many different meanings. And you talk about the layers. This certainly applies for some dreams, especially big dreams as we started out talking about. And for big dreams, you can look at it as a series of layers and you can get one interpretation and then reconsider the dream for another interpretation and you find out these interpretations do not conflict with each other, but they help fill in the bigger picture of what it is that you were dreaming about and why you were having that dream. Again, a dream could be rehashing one's experiences during the day, something we really need to remember if we're to live life more effectively in the future. But also the same dream might be allowing us to work through emotions. We don't have time to work through all of the emotional reactions we have during the day, but at night we can take those emotions, put them into a different context and continue to work them through. And then the dream might be telling us okay, you avoid this in the future, that posed a threat to you, and you now know how to avoid that in the future because you've rehearsed that 
So here you are, one dream serving three different functions. Hmm. Right. So sometimes it seems in dreams that we can have premonitions too, right? About things that that happen to us, so or that may happen to us. And you'd mentioned earlier that that's to help us prepare, maybe for how to deal with those things. But um, again, I'm I'm just curious about how we would know what may happen to us. You don't know until it's over. Sad to say. <laughs> Sad to say, every now and again, I run into people who have frequent premonitions in their dreams, and they can usually come up with a clue. One dreamer said, well, if dreams about a future, there's a luminescent quality about the dream. Another dreamer said, well, if there's numbers in the dream, I know that the dream is going to be about something in the future. We really don't know for sure. None of these ideas have ever been tested that well. However, the dream doesn't really make divisions into past, present, and future the way we do in waking life. Mm. To the dream, it's all past, present, future. It's all one. And so it's only the constraints on our everyday thinking that make us think, oh no, life is a lie in past, present, future. Sorry, it's not that simple. That's not the way the mind works. That's not the way time works. And we should not be surprised if we have a dream about something in the future. And then people say, well, doesn't this mean that we have no free will? Things are preordained? No, just the opposite. People who have dreams about some dire event in the future are almost always able to change that event so that the tragedy or the mishap does not take place. So dreams can remind us, dreams can say, if you continue the path on which you are going, that will happen to you. Okay, so the dreamer changes the path. The dreamer does not go on that midnight car ride. <laughs> the dreamer does not stay up all night studying for an exam. The dreamer does not accept the invitation to the party 50 miles away from where one is living in bad weather. So by changing one's path, one is more often than not able to avoid the dire outcome that was predicted in the dream. Hmm. I, I, um, <clears throat> I know that you have done some, some work in shamanism and uh, I, I worked a little bit with, uh, for a couple of years with this shaman. And um, one of the things we did there was we, we learned to uh, to help people with soul retrieval. Are, are are you familiar with that? With what? With soul retrieval. Oh, good heavens, yes. Yeah, I, very I, common in shamanism, of course. Yeah, I thought you would be, and the technique that we used was um, was very interesting to me. It was a lot like dreaming because the shaman would hold the head of the of the client who was lying down and would journey on behalf of the client to try to find some lost soul parts for the client. And then would, would relate the story of the journey to the client. And the client would invariably, in my experience, you know, find meaning in this journey that the, the shaman had had on his behalf. So is it possible we can dream for someone else? Actually, one of my students did a dissertation on that topic, dreaming for somebody else. He was a member of one of the Edgar Casey study groups in the Association for Research and Enlightenment. And so he had no trouble finding volunteers. And some of them would 
toss out a problem. And so the members of the group would be told, okay, dream about the answer to that problem. So they would be dreaming for the person who had the problem. And sure enough, more often than not, the dreams that they had on behalf of their group member did seem to give the answer to the problem. And that's roughly what's happening in soul retrieval. The shaman goes off and finds a soul which was lost due to a, tra a traumatic experience. Post-traumatic stress disorder contains many, many examples of people who've had a chunk of their psyche or their soul or, uh, uh, lost or stolen or taken. And so the shaman goes through a ritual to try to get that missing part of the soul back. And you're right, it's usually very effective. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it takes more than one try, of course, but the shaman uh, is skilled on that. That's been part of the shaman's training to do the soul retrieval, sure. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to ask you about is I've, I've noticed um, in dreams, and this is, I don't know if this is a good question or not, <laughs> but I'll ask it anyway. Sometimes in dreams, I notice that when I try to look at my watch or I try to read something in a book that I can't see what is there. I can't read it. And I'm, I'm my theory about that is, is that your brain, when you go to read something, when you pick it up to read it, you think your brain goes, okay, some information is coming in now and I'm, I'll, I'll receive this information. But in a dream, the source of the dream is your brain. <laughs> and if your brain goes into that, hey, I'm gonna receive some information from the outside, it, it can't really be provided by the dream. Well, that's a pretty good answer. Very few people are able to read or even do arithmetic in their dreams. And why should they? Dream, you're in a different state of consciousness while you're dreaming. And the state of consciousness you're in when you do reading doesn't even involve the whole brain. It involves, for most people, the left hemisphere of the brain. And even then there's a portion of the left hemisphere to think that these very complex skills are available while we're dreaming is simply not reasonable. And so as a result, I would say most people that I've been in contact with and that we know about from research studies do not find that they're able to read during a dream and if they are able to read, they see that the words actually start changing right in front of them. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Yeah. Well, I we've talked about, you and I have talked a little bit about uh, Jeremy Taylor's approach to the dream groups and having uh, people project careful to say, if it were my dream and not, not project their thoughts on another dream. You talked about psychodrama uh, or a gestalt sort of uh, method. What, what other ways are there that you've worked with dreams? Well, one technique that I can use if I have a one-to-one -one session with a person is to have them run through the dream and then I will have them retell the dream in as simple a term as possible. Like if they were retelling their dream and if they were to say, well, I was watching a newsboy and he was selling newspapers. I could say, okay, I don't know what a newsboy is. I don't know what newspapers are. Can you tell me? Well, a newsboy is somebody who is selling something. And a newspaper is where you get information. So in this dream, I was with somebody who was selling information. Okay, then I say, is there anything in your life 
involving selling information? Where you've been selling information or you've been buying information? Oh yes, and that all makes sense to them. So I have them go through actually, in most cases, the entire dream, reducing it to a very, very simple components. And then when I read the dream back to them, it clicks. Oh yes, now I know what that dream is all about. Hmm. Again, that's a dream technique that's very popular in China because in China, remember that everything that I say has to be translated. And so as they work with another partner in Paris, they don't have to wait for that translation. They can just go uh, right to the right to the dream interpretation method itself. Yeah, yeah. There are actually so many excellent dream interpretation techniques. I like the books by Patricia Garfield, the books by Gail Delaney. I mentioned those two people because they've written so many books on the topic. And their approach, approaches make very good common sense and they give plenty of examples. The books that I do not recommend to your listeners are the dream dictionaries, yeah. where they say, well, whenever you dream about somebody being pregnant, that means you're going to come into a lot of money. No, that is one of many, many possible interpretations for pregnancy, one of many. And we have to realize that back millennia ago, when people were in small groups and small cultures, at that time, there could be dream symbols that were the same for everybody in the culture. Those days are past. We now in a very complex culture where there are many subcultures, many ethnicities, and even within the same family, dreams might mean different things, different members of the family. So those dream dictionaries really don't work anymore. At their very best, they can get somebody started mm -hmm. And that's better than nothing. Well, if that meaning isn't true to my dream, what is true? And then they start to think about some other possibilities. I, I love that you say that about the dream dictionaries because <laughs> yeah, I've been frustrated sometimes with, with uh, someone who'll say, I know this is what it means. And no, <laughs> that's one meaning as you say, right? Exactly, There's, yes, well, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you did mention at the at the beginning when we were talking about big dreams about uh, teeth falling out or falling downstairs is kind of maybe sort of archetypal symbols that may have similar meanings across across several people. Oh, good heavens, yes, those dreams are so common. They mean different things to different people, different things in different times and places. You see the tooth falling out, that could be the advent of maturity, a person growing up. It could be somebody losing a prized possession that they'll never be able to get back again. It could be that they're getting rid of something that was no longer usable, even rotten, and they were waiting for something better to come out. Or it could be that they had a toothache and the dream is telling them get to a dentist. <laughs> yeah, that's great, that's great. Well, those, those are the questions that, that I had kind of prepared to talk to. I, mean, I know that the, the uh, other people may have some questions to you, for you. Um, do you have a, a favorite dream that, that either you've had or that you've heard? that you'd want to share with us as, as an example? Oh, good heavens. I 
have a lot of dreams about eating food, eating delicious food. And those dreams are very helpful now because as I recover from my illness, I have a very strange sense of taste mm -hmm. and my taste is not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. So the best taste experiences I have are actually in my dreams. And that's the only place where things taste the way they used to taste. And another reason I like those dreams about, about food, if I want to have a lucid dream, I tell myself, the next time I dream about going to a banquet, I'll know that this is a dream and I'll have the dream become lucid. Hmm. This is one of the very common ways of learning how to dream lucidly. You find something in your dream that comes and recurs. So in my case, whenever I sit down to eat, I ask myself, am I dreaming? <laughs> I look around, no, I don't know, I'm not dreaming. But eventually I'm gonna have a dream about eating a big meal. And I'll say, am I dreaming? And I look around the room, this doesn't look familiar. And I see strangers at the end of the table I don't recognize, I guess I must be dreaming. And so then at that moment, the dream does become lucid. And again, there are some excellent books on lucid dreaming, one by Robert Wagoner that tell people how they can train themselves to have lucid dreams if this is something that they, that they would feel they'd like to do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for answering my questions. And, and I think that Anne is going to direct some questions to you from the, the students, if that's OK. Yeah, and if it's OK, I'm going to ask a question of my own, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Stealing this moment. Um, my question is that, is it common um, that people's ability to lucid dream comes and goes with their creativity. Actually, actually, yes, it comes and goes. Even the very best lucid dreamers report times when they haven't been able to have a lucid dream for several weeks. Don't worry about it. This is typical of lucid dreams. It's very few people are able to dream on demand every single night. This is something like a lot of our other abilities that has a period of frequent lucid dreaming following by a period where maybe they've not been able to lucid dream. So that's the answer to that question. It, it, is it possible to get back to where um, one used to be with lucid dreaming? Yes, just don't take it too seriously. <laughs> Some people get very, oh, I'll, I've lost my, I build a lucid dream, I'll never have that again. No, if you put negative thoughts into the dream, uh, that's not going to help you. Just think here, so, well, this is something that comes and goes. I'll be patient for myself and maybe my ability will come back. Or maybe they need to use a prompt, like the prompt that I suggest before you go to sleep at night. Tell yourself, mm -hmm. Tonight, I will have a lucid dream and will remember it when I wake up. Tonight, I will have a lucid dream and I will remember it when I wake up. You say that 10 or 20 times for yourself, and that often helps you to have a lucid dream. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to share some questions from our participants. The first one that I have collected here um, asks that, I have found that when I don't like the direction of my dreams, I can force them to change direction. I can stop them in their tracks at times, but most often I get ahead of them and force them to go another direction. 
I've, I have had dreams that I'm not able to control. And that forces me to wake up with the attitude that if it's not going my way, I won't let them continue. Is this normal? Well, again, this is a type of lucid dreaming. Were you actually able to change the direction in the dream? But again, like all abilities, all your dreaming, don't expect me, you will be able to do this 100% of the time. There's nothing that always works in dreaming. This being one of them. Yes, usually you can change the direction of the dream, but then there's another possibility. Maybe you cannot change the direction of that dream because the dreaming is, dream is telling you something you need to know. So if you cannot change the direction of the dream, go back and look at that dream. See, is this dream giving me a message that I really need to pay attention to? That's another possibility. I should also mention that post-traumatic stress disorder nightmares, we train people to do exactly what you're telling to uh, us to do to have lucid dreams. Mm -hmm. It's very common for somebody to have a nightmare about accidentally killing a child in an automobile accident, in a war zone, whatever. Well, you can never bring that child back to life, but you can change the dream. Say in the dream you are killing that child unintentionally, but you're killing the child nonetheless, and you realize you're dreaming. Well, you can tell yourself, what can I do in my life in honor of that child? Maybe I can do volunteer work in a child's shelter for abused children. Maybe I can do some counseling work with parents who have lost their child children. Maybe I can take that absolutely dreadful experience and change it into something positive. And that can come out of the dream also. Thank you. I'm going to read you the next question. Um, this is from one of our Chinese students. He asked that previously you shared that in our dreams, we process our emotions from during the day, but didn't Freud already in his analysis of dreams, refute this explanation that dreams somehow would actively process or solve our problems from the day? Well, Freud actually saw things a little bit differently. He felt that most dreams are wish fulfillment, that we would fulfill something in the dream that we didn't dare do in our waking life. This is very different than processing emotion in your dream because processing an emotion means that you dream about something, whether it was a positive experience or not. And so if you had a person insult you during the day, you might have a dream in which you're actually working through that insult. It's not that you have a wish fulfillment, not that you like being insulted, but this is a feeling that you have to work through. And that's what we mean by emotionally downloading. Or it might be a very, very happy experience where you were given a very, very nice compliment. And maybe you didn't have time to process that compliment thoroughly while you were awake. So in the dream, you can relive that compliment and that's a more positive way of working something through. Thank you for that. And, and we will um, do the interpretation after the event is wrapped up so you can see the subtitles, okay? Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. For most of the time, I am a wanderer of my dream. I am not aware that I am in dreams and I don't have control over my dreams. Sometimes my dreams are very abstract or very constructed by modern technology. 
I would have an entire dream happening on an iPhone. I am wondering if this is common. You have to realize that no two people have identical dreams. Mm -hmm. Dreams are very individual, like the person's fingerprint. Some dream interpreters can read a dream and they know which member of the dream had that dream because that person's dreams are so, uh, so specific. So your dream, the abstract dream, no, it's not exactly a common type of dream, but every now and again, I do run into people who also have abstract dreams. So you're not the only one in the world who has them. Just bear in mind that this is a little unusual type of dreaming, but nevertheless, you're taking an abstract approach to do the same dream functions that I mentioned before. Some people are more realistic. Some people are surrealistic. Some people are abstract. No two dreamers dream the same way. Okay. Um, the next comment, but also I guess a question too, is that some dreams, according to Chinese superstition, are messages sent directly from those diseased? What are your views on that? I think that maybe every once in a long, long while, there can be a message from the deceased or a message from somebody who represents the deceased. So I would not argue a person out of that as being one possible interpretation with the caveat, yes, this is possible, but that type of dream does not happen very, very often. Hmm. And again, it might not actually be a dream from the deceased person himself or herself. It might be the memory of that person that we have. And the memory of that person is enough to rekindle what we remember about that person. And so it becomes sort of a virtual message of that person. Thank you. Um, another question, do recurring dreams mean there is an unresolved problem? How might I settle it or resolve it? Lucidly maybe? Well, lucid dreaming, of course, would be the ideal way if you're able to have a lucid dream. And you're right, if we have a recurring dream over and over, it probably is an unresolved issue. And it can be an unresolved problem. It can be an unresolved emotion. It can be an unresolved threat, any of these things. But we need to pay special attention to those repetitive dreams. Now, a while ago, I mentioned repetitive PTSD nightmares. Now we're talking about something a little bit different because this type of dream is not a nightmare that you're talking about. There, they might even be little dreams rather than big dreams. Some little dreams repeat themselves. So whatever the event, these do require special attention on our part. Mm -hmm. Here's another one um, from a Chinese participant. When your dreams become reality, is this the power of our subconscious? Well, it's a power of our unconscious in a very unusual way. That dream was going to become reality anyway, because we were able to glimpse into the future. And we had all of the knowledge in our unconscious. And so by having that dream, it's a matter of pulling all of that together and coming up with a dream that seems to be predicting the future, but actually it is simply coming up with a dream 
that reflects what we already know about the future. So this is one reason it's so difficult to find the right term. You talk about a premonitory dreams, precognitive dreams, but how do we know that those dreams are simply giving voice to something that in our unconscious, we already know the answer to. That event has already been happening in the unconscious and that happens in our dream and now it'll happen in waking life. We have to give our unconscious credit for much more wisdom than we usually attribe it to. Thank you. Um... What books about dreams would you recommend? I'm unclear as what books are available in Chinese aside from my own, which I've already mentioned. But I think that there's a new book out called why we dream that I think is very well written. It's very firmly based on dream science. And just go to Amazon.com and type in why we dream and you will find the name of the author. She's a British psychologist. I hate to tell you, I don't remember her name off the top of my head, but that has been the most recent book on dreams that I have read, that I recommend. Now there is a book that's a year or two older, and this is a book put together by the editors of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And this is like a dream handbook that answers all the possible questions you'd ever have about dream. Go to IASD website, ASD International, and go to their list of books that they publish and you'll find that one listed. As I say, that is very comprehensive that it gives a lot of other books too, but this book for which I wrote a long introduction, by the way, is if you had to buy one book that's very comprehensive, that would be the book. One book for the dream science would be Why We Dream. So there you are, I'll recommend those two books, okay? You're oh, muted, I yeah. Can't hear. Can't hear. You're muted, Ann. How about now? No, that, that I... Okay, awesome. All right. Was trying to mute my baby crying. Usually don't dream about my baby crying. I don't know what that means. Uh, here's another question um, on recurrent dreams. What are recurrent dreams trying to tell us? especially when I don't like the dream content, but it still reoccurs. How do I stop such recurrent dreams? Well, you can just tell yourself to wake up. That'll do it. <laughs> also, if you take a look at all the studies that have been done dreams, we have more unpleasant dreams than we have pleasant dreams. Mm. Why should this be a surprise? We need to work through unpleasant emotions that we've had during the day. And... Also, if we have an unpleasant dream, we're more likely to forget it. So we don't even remember those dreams. It's only if you have somebody in a sleep laboratory and wake them up time after time again, that you find out the unpleasant dreams are more common than the pleasant dreams. They're serving their purpose, not something to be alarmed about. They're serving their purpose and they're helping you work through the unpleasant emotion. That's one of the things dreams are supposed to do. I think this is a related question as well. Um, when dreams 
show that there's something bad happening, how do I prevent it from happening? Now, I don't, I'm not clear whether it's preventing it from happening in the dream or preventing it from happening in real life. Well, don't try to prevent it happening in the dream because it might be serving a useful purpose for you in the dream. Just go along with it. Unless it gets to be too horrendous, then you can simply tell yourself to wake up. In waking life, what you need to do is to take a look at the dream and look at what we call the critical, oh, the critical focus. What is the part of the dream where the negative event is about to occur? You simply pay attention to your waking life and do not let that event from, from occurring. The, there's a wonderful play by J.B. Priestley from decades ago, Dangerous Crossing, where a cocktail is going on, a cocktail party, and then somebody at the party mentions something, it's a secret that another person at the cocktail party knew nothing about. That secret unleashes a chain of events that are so horrendous that one of the people in the group kills herself. Hmm. After she kills herself, the lights go black. And then you go back in time and you go back to just before that statement was made that ultimately ended in somebody's suicide. As that person is about to speak, a truck goes by outside, drowning out what the person was saying. So it never happened. And the uh, negative results never took place. Okay, so let's take that back to what's happening in your waking life and in the dream. In the dream, and I've used this example before, you might be about to go to a party, but in the dream, going to the party got you in an accident in which everybody was killed. Okay. In waking life, you do not take the car to the party. You find another way of getting to the party or you send your regrets. You don't want to miss the party, of course. So I think it's better to attend the party virtually or to find another way of getting there. But if you feel very strongly about it, don't tell people, oh, I had a dream that if I come to the party, it'll be a disaster. Don't tell people about that or they'll think you're some sort of a kook and maybe you are for taking this too seriously. But if something is really, really pressing upon you with a lot of emotion, try to find a way to avoid taking the step that would have led you into that disaster. Thank you. I should, I should recommend another book, The Gift, G-I-F-T by Sally Ryan Feather, the daughter of J.B. Ryan and Louisa E. Ryan, who founded Modern Parapsychology. And they collected thousands of dreams from all over the world. And when a person had a dream about a disaster, in 85% of the cases, they took methods to avoid the disaster and it worked, 85% of the cases. So other people have tried to use the technique that I just told you about to work for them, it could work for you. Who's the author again? The author, Sally Ryan, R-H-I-N-E, Feather, F-E-A-T-H-E-R. The name of the book is The Gift, G-I-F-T. Sally Ryan Feather. It's a very readable book. It should be in tra translated into Chinese, by the way. It's
Oh, I see Angel Morgan is with us. Hello, Angel. Angel, what is the name of the book that Bob Haas edited that IASC puts out? I believe um, that is a really good question. I think it's called Dreams. Dreams, and then it has a subtitle. I can look that up. Angel Morgan is the outgoing president of IASD. And so I'm delighted we have her. Oh, the link has been us. shared. Okay. The link for the, the gift. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. It's great to see you too, Stan. Angel, now that since we have you and have you spotlighted um, or pinned with us, is there any questions that you have with Stanley or any any additional comments you want to share with some of with us from the earlier questions? Oh my goodness, thank you. It's been wonderful just to hear Stan talk again. Uh, I, I love hearing him talk. I just found the name of the book that you asked about. Um, it is called Dreams, Understanding Biology, Psychology and Culture. And that has many authors from ISD who've contributed. There you are. Thank you for the title. Highly recommended. Thank you. You're welcome. You're so welcome. Um, Understanding psychology, biology, and culture. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have uh, any questions for Stan other than. Um, you know, just to say it's wonderful to hear you talk about all of these wonderful ideas about dreams and dreaming, and it's so important. And I just, I always emphasize from, from having worked with Stan and learned from Stan over the years, just how many different kinds of dreams there are. And when people ask about dreams, there is no one answer. There are so many kinds of dreams. And when you know, you can go from a method to the dream, or you can go from the dream to the method. And I, I think that's really important to remember is that when you hear a dream, what, when I hear a dream, it makes me think of, well, which method would work best with that particular dream, or what kind of extraordinary dream might it be, or what kind of ordinary dream or big dream might it be, because there are no two dreams as well as there are no yeah, there are no um, two of the same dreamers. So. Oh, thank you, Angel. That's exactly the point that I was making. There are many, many different types of dreams because there are many, many reasons why we dream. And one person's dreams might be very, very different than another person's dreams. So could you put in a plug for IASD and tell our listeners how they can become members of the International Association of the Study of Dreams? Absolutely. And I believe Anne has put uh, the link to the website. It's asdreams.org. And there you can go right onto that website and click on membership and how to become a member. And there are ways to become a member. And when I was at... Um, in graduate school with Stanley many, many years ago, that was the first thing he said to me is, you know, I have been dream working my whole life since I was four years old, but he said, you're working in a bubble. <laughs> you really need to join the IASD and find, you know, other dream workers out there and connect with them and learn from them. And that was such a gift. Um, and I, I've been a member since 2007, I believe of the IASD and just finished two years as president, as Stan said. So it's been a very incredible journey with that organization and with you, Stan. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Angel. Um, it's great that you're able to join us today. And this is also uh, my opportunity to share with um, our Chinese students that I am working very hard to see if Angel can join us and be the person who's teaching you um, about dreams and dreaming for our future courses. Um, but she's trying to see if she can work it in her schedule. So we'll see, okay? Um, but yes, uh, please go and see that website and maybe you'll find some resources for yourself. Um, there are a few other questions. Um, I have collected them. 
maybe I can email it to Stanley afterwards for you to answer so that we can get those questions answered. But for today, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And I know some, time, um, some of you were messaging me earlier about your friends not being able to join this, um, this event. You know, it turned out to be really popular. Um, and I, we're really glad that for those of you who are able to join us from the beginning till now, that be, that's great. But um, we were able to luckily allow a few more people in um, halfway through. So if you like to hear more about dreams or you would like to hear more about various conversations, I believe Sophia would love to host more conversations in the future among different faculty members and different scholars and different transpersonalists, okay? Just let us know. We love to have dialogue. And today, I just wanna thank um, Robert for bringing up this idea. And I thank Stanley for joining us for this conversation. And I thank Angel for joining us as well. Um, thank everybody for your time. And I hope you all have lovely daydreams and night dreams, okay? And um, however fantastic they may be, whether they are deemed good dreams or bad dreams, um, I hope you enjoy them and have a good relationship okay. with dreams. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Thank Stanley. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Anne. Bye-bye. Bye, Angel.